Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to read verses 1 through 15, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 15. And then after we read that, we are going to uh, ask you to keep your Bible open for a while. We've got a, a little bit of a lengthy introduction this morning, but uh, it, I think it'll help you to understand. Then we will go back and look at the passage, so please keep your Bible open and stay with us. Right now, let's read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 1, it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. There came also some that told Jehoshaphat saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria and behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Given even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that there is none able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? <clears throat> And they dwelt therein, and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil comes upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, and then thou hear and help, and now behold the children of Ammon, and Moab, and Mount Seir, whom would thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jeriel, Jeriel, son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord God in the midst of the congregation and said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor, be, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. I want to talk to you about that last phrase, verse 15, The battle is not yours, but God's. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can come to you in prayer. Thank you for those folks who are gathered here. And again, for those who may be listening, we pray again for those who are unable to do either one and pray that you would bless them and to be with them. Lord, help us to reach out to the best of our ability and even beyond our own ability with your help to those who need a touch, those who need a word, those who need a prayer. And help us, Lord, to keep you in the center of all of our thinking. And Father, I pray that you would just help us in these next few moments as we consider your word and consider the battle that is before us, the battle that we are in, and that we cannot deal with it in our own strength. But we need your strength. We need your guidance. For Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The Christian life itself is a battle. Now, I am not talking about a physical battle. Uh, Jesus said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. But now is my kingdom not of this world. And he's saying there is not a physical battle for us as Christians. There's a spiritual battle. Now, if you're not a Christian, let me say this. If you're not a Christian, you're not in the battle. Surely somebody's saying, now, preacher, don't you mean if I'm not a Christian, I am the enemy in the battle? And no, I do not mean that. I mean, if what I said, if you're not a Christian, you're not even in the battle, one side or the other. Uh, the battle is not between the believer and the unbeliever. It is not. Never did the Lord tell us to go out and conquer with the sword and to bring people to Christ. The battle is between God and Satan. The battle is between the flesh and the spirit. The battle is between good and evil. The battle is between right and wrong. The battle is not between the Christian and the unbeliever. The Christian is in the battle. The unbeliever is not. Listen to God's word. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 17. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not once is a physical enemy named. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. When you've done all you can do and you can't do anything else, you can still stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The battle is far more internal than it is external. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. For though we walk our daily life, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What is it saying? Who's going to revenge disobedience? Not us. God. I said to a person on one occasion, uh, I said, you know, uh, you're, you're doing something wrong. And what you're doing is wrong. But you are not going to answer to me for that wrong. You are going to answer to God for that wrong. I, I, and when you answer to God for it, I won't have anything to do with it. You see, all of us have to understand that the Lord God is going to do what's right. Again, James chapter 4, verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your own lusts that war in your members? Why do we fight with each other? Why do we have wars? Because we have war inside of us. 1 Peter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts that which do what? War against the soul. Galatians 5, 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. So the real enemies of the Christian are not other people. The real enemies of the Christian are these. First of all, the world. Now, when we say the world here, we do not mean the people of the world. You read in your English Bible, it talks about the world, and sometimes that means the people of the world. Sometimes it means the physical planet, but in this case, it has a different meaning. It means the world system, the philosophy of the world, the mindset of the world. So John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 18, love not the world 
neither the things that are in the world. In that case, he's talking about the physical planet and things in it. Don't fall in love with all that. Well, shouldn't we take care of things? Yes, we have not only uh, should we do it, we have a God-given duty to take care of the things which he has given us. You think we ought to take care of our planet? Yeah, we should. God said to. Uh, do you think we ought to be conservationists? Yeah, I've always thought that all my life. We ought to conserve wildlife. We ought to conserve uh, wetlands. We ought to conserve other things. Yeah, that's, that's important. But that's not the main thing. We don't fall in love with them. We don't worship them. There are people and have been for millennia, this is not a new thing, who actually worship the planet itself. That's sad. That's sad. There are still people who worship the moon, people who worship the sun and so forth, and other gods and goddesses. They're worshiping the creation more than the creator. That's what John means when he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't get too attached to things. I remember hearing Curtis Hudson preach years ago. He said, there's going to be a fire come one day. And the fire comes, it's going to consume everything. And all that you worked for, all that you worked to build up is not going to be there. He said, when the fire comes, when it's finished, you won't be able to tell which pile of ashes was your Rolls Royce and which one was my Chevrolet. It, it won't matter. It won't matter. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? For all that is in the world, what is that? The lust of the flesh, a continual desire to consume. The lust of the eyes, a desire to have what you see. And the pride of life, and that pride which fills us up, which causes some people to say, I am God. Man said that to me just this last week. He said, I do not believe in God other than in myself. I find God in myself. That's the pride. That's the pride of mankind. To think that he himself is God. I'm not picking on that individual. I'm saying that's a mindset many people have. Certainly not unique to that, that one person. But here's the problem. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And here's the problem with that. The world passeth away. It's temporary. Everything that we have is temporary. It, if you haven't learned anything in the first six months of this year, you should have learned that. Things are temporary. Things are changing. Things do not last. Everything is not as it was, nor shall it be exactly as it was. The truth of the matter is, John writes and he says, The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, he said, it is the last time. What do you mean the last time? He means the last time he's going to tell you about this. No, that's not what he means at all. You know what he means when he says it is the last time? He means we're in the end times. Well, wait a minute, preacher. I don't know about that because when did he write that? Oh, about 2,000 years ago. Well, don't you think if he thought it was the last time 2,000 years ago and it was, everything was going to end, it would have happened by now? Well, he thought so. He did when he wrote that. Well, how do you explain that? It's very simple. We're on God's time schedule, not ours. See, you look at how God has done things. When the first prophecy was given that a Messiah, a Savior, would come to the world, from the time that first prophecy was given until the time that it happened, it was well over 4,000 years in happening. The prophecy now is Jesus is coming again. It's only been 2,000 years since that prophecy. If we were on the time, same time schedule, and hear me carefully, nothing in the world, nothing in the Bible, nothing anywhere says we have to be on the same time schedule. So it, it would be a mistake to say we're on the same time schedule. Well, how do you know what the time schedule is? I don't. That's in God's hands. But if we were on the same time schedule, we could go on another couple thousand years. Do you think that's going to happen? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look that way. But it didn't look that way in John's time either. What are you saying? I'm saying Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour of his turn 
uh, of his return. And if he said, no man knows, that includes me. I don't know either. But John says it's the last time. As you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. What does that mean? You've heard that one's going to come who's going to be against Christ, who's going to be the opposite of Christ, and that's true. But John's saying there are already many people like that. And there have been, there were in John's day, have been ever since, still are, and will be until the end. Well, you saying, preacher, you don't believe that one person will rise who will be called the Antichrist? No, I didn't say that at all, neither did John. What he's saying is, you're looking for that one person, there's already many like that, doing the same job, the same work. What is that work? We'll come to that. Finally, John said this, whereby we know that it is the last time. How do we know? Because there are many Antichrists in the world. Now, if you're a Christian this morning, you're in the battle. Well, I don't want to be in the battle. Well, I got good news for you. You're not in it alone. Christians are commanded to be in the battle. Therefore, Christians are soldiers. We sometimes sing this song, and I, I thought about singing it this morning. Obviously, we went another way. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. What does that mean? Again, it doesn't mean you're going to take up guns and swords and all that and go out and conquer the world. doesn't mean that. It's not talking about that. What's it talking about? It's talking about spiritual warfare. So a Christian soldier must realize he's been called to war. 1 Timothy 1.18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good warfare. Secondly, a Christian soldier must prepare himself for the battle. He must be in a right relationship with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Then number three, the Christian soldier must recognize who the enemy is. John already told us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the world is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, not of the Father, but of the world. The enemy is not carnal, but spiritual, Paul said. Revelation 16, uh, 14, For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Then the Christian soldier must realize that the warfare is not easy. Luke 14, 31, Jesus said, Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Paul wrote this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A Christian soldier must lean upon the Lord for strength, realizing that the battle is not his, but the Lord's. When David faced Goliath in the Valley of Elah, 1 Samuel 17, 47, we read, all, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. Did you hear that? The Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. In our text this morning, Jehaziel understood this, 2 Chronicles 20, 15 again, and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. It's not you. It's not you. Christians must realize a few things. They must realize that all battles have casualties. Some don't take the battle seriously. During the Civil War in the 1860s, when the early days of the war, 
there were some people, there was a battle in Virginia and there were some people from the Washington DC area went out like they were going to a sporting event, took picnic meals and went out and sat uh, up on a hillside to watch the battle. And I guess they thought everything was fine until the battle started coming to them where they were. Some do not take the battle seriously. Some have defeated, I'm sorry, some have deserted in the heat of the battle. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Don't start out as a soldier for the Lord and then turn back. Psalm 53, 3, Every one of them has gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Job 23, 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of thy lips, for I esteem the word of his mouth more than my necessary food. Some have become traitors in the battle. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What does he mean? Having a form, acting like, claiming that they are the good people, but denying the power of God. Then some have grown weary in the battle. It gets hard. Day after day, the things that we have to face up to the things you don't want to face up to but they're there second thessalonians 3 13 but ye brethren be not weary in well-doing galatians 6 9 and be not weary in well-doing for in due season ye shall reap if you faint not if you don't quit some have been wounded in the battle in every battle someone gets hurt and the wounds are very deep Sometimes you get wounded by your own side. In the American Civil War, General Thomas Jackson, they called him Stonewall Jackson, was considered one of the great military minds of his day. You know how he died? He was shot by one of his own men. Those things happen. Some have fallen in the battle. We have lost some of those who are dearest to us. We have lost some great soldiers, but that will continue to happen because death comes to all of us. And some will be victorious in the battle. Paul writes, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, when this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now I told you it would be a long introduction. I want you to take you now to 1 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1. It was a hard time for the kingdom of Judah. They were being attacked from multiple sides. And they were in a real physical battle. But God had promised them things. If they would be faithful to him, they would receive these promises. In chapter 20, verse 1, it says, It came to pass after this that the children of Moab one group, the children of Ammon, another group, and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, to battle. Now where are these people coming from? Moab and Ammon, where is that? That is in what today we would call the country of Jordan. Now are you saying these are the Jordanian people? Not necessarily, but it's the same land area, the same territory. Verse two, then 
there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, on this side Syria. What does that mean? That means up north by the Sea of Galilee, there's Syria. So not only were the Moabites, the Ammonites, attacking from right down near Jerusalem, but farther north, the Syrians were attacking. And the end of verse 2, And behold, they be in Hazan Tamar, which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. He's being attacked by the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Syrians all at the same time. Three different armies attacking his kingdom. He doesn't have the military strength to withstand those people. And he's afraid. Folks, it's not unusual, it's not unnatural to be afraid when you're being attacked. But Jehoshaphat did something very wise that a lot of people don't do when they're afraid, when they're under attack, when they know that things are difficult. Here's what he did. Look, verse 3, And Jehoshaphat feared, period, and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. When Jehoshaphat was afraid, what did he do? He sought after the Lord. You know, Jehoshaphat had enough wisdom to say this. I can't do this thing by myself. I cannot fight this battle alone. I do not have the strength. My army doesn't have the strength. My people don't have the strength. We can't do this. And he sought the Lord. And what happened? Verse 4. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. They had a national turning to God. Folks, if there's anything that our country needs today, it is a wholesale turning to God. Amen. You know why we're having the problems we're having? Yeah, because so-and-so did this, and that person did that, and those other people did. No, that's not why. You know why? Because we turned our back on God. That's why. That's what's caused all these problems. And it's not going to turn the other way until we give our heart to the Lord again. And you know what? It is a waste of time for you and I to sit here in this building, and I'm so happy that you are here. Don't misunderstand me. It is a waste of time for us to sit here and think, boy, I wish all those people out there would get right with God. That's a waste of time. If nothing's going to happen until we are the ones who are seeking after God like these people and Judah sought after God. Verse 5. Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. What does that mean? He's at the temple. He's up on the temple mount in Jerusalem. And he's standing there and he's talking to the people of his country. In verse 6 he said, O Lord God of our fathers, Art not thou God in heaven? Aren't you the God of heaven? That rulest not, uh, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? Are you not God of all the earth? Not just our God, your God of all the earth. And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Do you not have all power? Is he criticizing God? He's not. He's naming the things that God is and the things that God has done. Verse 7, Art thou not our God, which did drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? He's claiming the Abrahamic covenant. You'll find that in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. And Jehoshaphat goes on, verse 8, And they dwelt therein in the land and built thee a sanctuary therein, therein for thy name saying if when evil come upon us as the sword judgment or pestilence park on that word for a minute pestilence you know what pestilence means if you study that word out we've talked to you about this two or three times recently pestilence is what we're having right now what do you mean what we're right this coronavirus that's a pestilence that's what this word is talking about. Let's look at this verse again, verse 9. If when evil comes upon us, as with a sword, a military attack, judgment, even from God, 
pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then wilt thou hear and help. You know, the Lord promised that. He promised that to them when they built the temple. And he said, in back in the same book, uh, Chronicles, he said, if you'll call on me, call on me. Who needs to call on him? His people. Again, it's a waste of time. You're going to wait for the world to get right with God. It's God's people who need to turn to God. Now, well, what about the rest of the world? It's our job to evangelize them. What do you mean evangelize? Give them the gospel. I've heard recently arguments over what the gospel is. And the gospel is this, the gospel is that. There's different gospels and all that. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. There's only one gospel. Paul defines it, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He didn't say I declare a gospel. He said I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, the gospel, by which you are saved. There's only one. He tells us what it is. He goes on to say, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. None other. None other has ever been. None other ever will be. That's it. And that is the gospel by which also you're saved. That's not my opinion. That's not this church's teaching. That is what... The word of God says. So Jehoshaphat is standing before his people and he says, here we are at the house of God. Here we are, the people of Judah, the heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Here we are, the people of God, and we are in trouble. So what are we going to do? Well, look at the problem, verse 10. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab just across the Jordan River from where he is standing and talking about this is where these folks are. All they have to do is cross the river to be there. Does he know that? Absolutely. He looks at it every day. I met a man not long ago who said he was from Jordan. He said, have you ever been there? I said, no, sir, I've never been there, but I've seen it. And he stepped back for a second. And he says, well, if you've never been there, how have you seen it? I said, well, I, where I was standing, I could look and see Jordan. He thought a minute. He said, you were in Israel. I said, yes, sir, I was. And he said, okay, I understand what you're saying now. See, the truth of the matter is, Ammon and Moab were so close at hand. The attack was coming. They had already assembled their armies. It was about to happen. And Mount Seir, which is in Moab, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. What's he talking about there? When Moses was leading the people of Israel and they came down below the Dead Sea, came up on the east side, they wanted to pass through Moab and Ammon and the Moabites wouldn't let them pass through and it was... It was not good. They did get through and they encamped on the east side and then they came over. But God would not let the children of Israel fight against the Moabites. He would not let them fight against the Ammonites. Why? They were related. They were part of the same family. And he said, you're not going to fight them. And they didn't. That's what Jehoshaphat's talking about in verse 10. Verse 11, he said, Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. We didn't fight them when we could have. You told us, Lord, not to fight them, and we didn't. And now they want to attack us. And what do they want to do? They want to drive us out of our land. You know, there's still people there who want to do that very thing. So what do you do about it? Here's the battle. 
It's real. Here's the attack. It's real. And it's more than you can handle. One country facing three. What are you going to do? Verse 12. O God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. I love the next phrase. Neither know we what to do. You've been there, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Do you ever get there where you just don't know what to do? I mean, there's trouble around you. And you don't have a plan. You don't have a strategy. You don't have the resources. And you do not know what to do. Folks, I'm telling you, I've been there many times. I'm sure you have too. Where you just don't know what to do. You want to do something. You wish you could do something. But you don't know what to do. And that's exactly where Jehoshaphat was. Look at verse 12 again. Oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. Look at the last phrase of verse 12. But our eyes are upon thee. We don't know what to do, Lord. But we're looking to you. Our eyes are upon you. Our focus is upon you. We are looking to you, Lord, to help us. We're in big trouble. We don't have much of a chance. We don't know the answer. We don't know how to handle this. But you do. And we're looking to you. So verse 13, And all Judah stood before the Lord. With their little ones, their wives, and their children, the families gathered together. Everybody, you've heard this a lot, but this was true. Everybody was in this thing together. And all their families are there. And they're hearing their king speak. And their king is saying, we don't know what to do. But their king isn't saying it to them. He's saying it in a prayer. And he's calling out to God. And he's saying, our eyes are are upon thee and the people are there finally a man of God steps up in verse 14 then upon Jehaziel the son of Zechariah the son of Benaiah the son of Jeriel the son of Madaniah a Levite of the sons of Asaph stop right there why does it bother to give us this man's Genealogy. At this point, when everybody's in trouble and all this problem is coming, who cares who his ancestors were? Well, God does. But God is telling us something here. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, Zechariah the priest, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. Well, who cares? Who, who is Asaph? Can I tell you who Asaph is? David wrote most of the Psalms in the book of Psalms, but he didn't write all of them. There, Moses wrote at least one. There are several Psalms, a good number of them. We don't have an author, don't know who wrote them. But you know who wrote the second most Psalms after David? David's number one. You know who's number two? Asaph. Asaph was in David's court. Asaph was the chief musician in David's court. And obviously he was part of the family of the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. And he wrote almost as many psalms as David. So that, this is his grandson, great-grandson, who's talking. And notice what it says about him, verse 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeriel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Ava, Asaph. What about this guy? Then upon him, what about him? Came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Let's talk about that for a minute. What does that mean, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him? Well, first of all, it means what it says. God's Holy Spirit came upon this man. But how does that play out? What does that mean? Did he start to do physical things that people said, oh, that must be the Spirit of God moving him? No, it doesn't indicate that at all. If you go through your Bible, you start back in Genesis and you read through. In Genesis, it says Joseph was a man in whom the Spirit of God is. You read through your Bible 
and you're going to find that there are times when the Holy Spirit of God comes on people in a powerful way. Now, in, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people and left people. So many examples of that. One that's very clear. When Saul was chosen to be the first king of Israel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon King Saul. But when Saul turned away from the Lord, don't miss this, when Saul turned away from the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord left King Saul. And when David was anointed to be king to replace Saul, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. But when David sinned, his great sin with Bathsheba, he writes a psalm of repentance, and his prayer for repentance is in Psalm 51. And you know what part of that prayer is? David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He did not want to lose the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon people and left people in the Old Testament times, but in the New Testament times, after the cross, after the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon believers and stays. And we have what's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. So if you have trusted Jesus as your Savior, you received him. Somebody said the other day, where does the Bible say you received him? A good question. Let's answer it. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe upon his name. When you believe and receive Christ, you receive not just the Son, you receive Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And John 14 and John 16, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come and be with you and be in you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, know you not that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? You see that you are the temple of God. You see the Holy Spirit dwells in believers. But, hear me, this is so important. And this is what we're reading about here. The, there are times when the Holy Spirit gives a spiritual power to a person. And again, if you read it's consistent all the way through the Bible, that always happens and only happens when God is empowering us to do his will, to do what he wants us to do. Joseph, as I mentioned, was empowered with the Holy Spirit to do what? To be the person who spoke up and was the second ruler of Egypt and rescued not only the nation of Egypt, but his own people, the people of Israel, and God used him to do that. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. You read throughout that in Moses' day, Moses is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then Bezalel is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Moses is given the plans to build the tabernacle, but Bezalel was the man who actually built it. You read farther and you'll find the Spirit of the Lord comes upon others and leaves others And Samson. Samson was a strong man. He was a, a physically strong man, but he did his great feats of strength when the Spirit of God came upon him and late in his life. When Samson had gotten away from God, when Samson had violated the vow that he took before God, the Spirit of God left him. And he didn't have his miraculous strength anymore. We've already talked about Saul and David and others. And then we come to the New Testament and the Spirit of the Lord comes and fills the apostles and fills the first church in Jerusalem to do what? To equip them for the job of carrying the gospel out to the rest of the world. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. Jehaziel is of the priestly tribe, descendant of Asaph, and he comes up as the king is praying and before the people and all the people, all their families are assembled there in Jerusalem and they're in such dire straits, they're about to be attacked, probably annihilated, and they're afraid. And they cry out to God. And listen to me. When you cry out to God, he hears you and he answers you. Jeremiah 33, 3. Jeremiah called the weeping prophet. Why is he called the weeping prophet? Because Jeremiah preached and preached and preached to the people. Turn back to God. Do not let your heart turn to idols. If you do not turn back to God, you're going to lose your nation. The Babylonians are going to come. They're going to carry you all away. They didn't listen to Jeremiah, though he preached for years. They didn't listen. And the Babylonians came and took them away. And they lost their nation. Folks, God raises up nations and he brings down nations. 
We need to understand that. Oh, we did it all ourselves. Not a chance. Not a chance. So Jeremiah, they wouldn't listen to him. And so he wept. The book of Lamentations in the Bible, a lamentation is a weeping. You could call the book of Lamentations the weepings of Jeremiah, and you'd be accurate. But God said to Jeremiah this. He said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What's Jeremiah's job in that verse? Call. Call. There's power in prayer, and we need to pray, and we need to pray in faith believing. God says, you pray, he'll answer. So in verse 15, Jehaziel, empowered by the Spirit of God, is speaking. And he said, hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, all of you people out here, listen the ones who live in town, the ones who live in the surrounding area, all of you of Judah and Jerusalem, and you, your majesty, the king, listen. Thus saith the Lord. Stop there. You and I need to get back to thus saith the Lord. It's not what I say, what you say, what somebody else says. What did God say? Thus saith the Lord. Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Do you understand what he's saying? God is saying through Jehaziel, by the Holy Spirit, he's saying, don't be afraid of these attacking armies. Now, physically speaking, hear me, physically speaking, there was every reason to be afraid. There was. Imagine, if you will, that you had an enemy, somebody who hated you, somebody who wanted to destroy you. There's one person. That one person is very strong. That one person is a very formidable enemy. But maybe you could deal with that one person. But what if that one person went out and got 40 or 50 friends? Now what are you going to do? Not much. Not much. See, that's the way it is in life sometimes. I've heard people say, you know, sometimes it feels like the whole world's against me. Well, can I help you with that? First of all, the whole world probably doesn't even know you exist. <laughs> okay? So, so they're certainly not all against you. But it feels that way sometimes. Truth of the matter is, there are times when our circumstances are overwhelming, when our challenges are more than we can bear. And when, like King Jehoshaphat, we have to say we don't know what to do. But our eyes are upon thee, Lord. So Jehazel says, Hearken ye, all Jerusalem and inhabitants, uh, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Why not? For the battle is not yours, but God's. Drop down to verse 17. He said, you shall not need to fight this battle. <laughs> Did you hear that? You don't have to. The battle is not yours, it's God's. You know what? He'll fight it for you if you let him. You have, you have a simple choice to make. You can do it on your own. You can, you can jump out there and say, boy, I'm tough. I'm going to do it. You probably aren't going to win. The truth of the matter is, you need to understand, as David understood, the battle's not mine. The battle is the Lord's. You need to understand, as Jehaziel says centuries later to the people of Judah and Jerusalem, the battle is not yours, but God's. You need to understand that God puts these things in the Bible so that he can say to us in the 21st century, the battle is not yours, but God's. So let me ask you this, and we're finished. These are thought questions. You don't need to answer me out loud. 
But how goes the battle for you? How's it going in your life? How goes the battle? Well, let's back up a little bit. Are you in the battle? What do you mean am I in the I told you at the beginning. If you're not a believer, you're not, you're not even in the battle. Where am I? On the sidelines. The battle isn't between people. It's a spiritual battle. If you're not in the battle, will you join? What are you asking me? I'm asking you, will you trust Jesus and be saved? That's what I'm asking you. Why are you asking me I want to join a fight? Yeah, there are lots of people who do. But the truth of the matter is, the battle's not yours. It's God's. Number three, have you lost loved ones in the battle? Maybe you have. Have you been wounded in the battle? Maybe, like General Jackson, wounded by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Have you been betrayed in the battle? Have those who you loved and trusted turned on you? Have you deserted in the battle? Have you grown weary in well-doing and you say, I, I can't, can't do this anymore. I quit. How goes the battle? Let me encourage you. You need to realize some things. You need to realize that you are on the victory side. You are. You're on the victory side. I like what I've heard other preachers say many times. It's certainly not original with me. But how do you know I'm on the victory side? How do you know we're going to win? I, I, I took the book and I read the last chapter. Okay. All right. You can do that too. We know who wins. Can I go farther than that? We know who's already won. Realize that you are on the victory side. Secondly, realize that the battle is not yours. It's God's. When those three countries teamed up to fight Judah, God had made promises to Judah and God was in control. And what they needed to do was trust him. And they did. So you're telling me the Moabites and the Ammonites and the uh, Syrians didn't conquer them at that time? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. And God delivered them. Later on, this is not going to be on your screen there, but in the 20th verse, it said, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. You know what God's asking for you today? He's asking for you the same thing. Believe in the Lord your God. Put your faith and trust in him. Know that while the battle is hard, and the battle is strong, and you don't have what it takes, you can trust him. I want you to do that. I want you to do what we are going to sing here in just a few minutes. I want you to turn your eyes upon Jesus. And remember that the battle is not yours, but God's. And be strengthened and be encouraged and know that you are on the winning side. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for each and every person who's gathered here today. Thank you for those who may be listening online. And Lord, it is my prayer.